All right, let's jump in. We started last Sunday, and we're going to continue this Sunday. Mary spoke Thursday night a little bit unexpectedly, so I was supposed to finish this morning, but I will take Thursday night's message, put it into this morning. And next Sunday, bring your booklet back because we'll put the last part of this there. So let's start in. I'm, I'm going to review a little bit, but I want to throw some thoughts out to you, get you thinking. Kind of goes along with, I had this already written in uh, for Thursday night, and then Mary showed me what the Lord showed her, and I said, you know, the God might be wanting us to park on this a little bit. And I had her speak, and coming back, with this, but some of the stuff she brought up is almost hand in hand with what I had written down here. I'm, I got a question for you. Why will a mother, mother of a family, mother of children, endanger her own life to protect her child? Because she loves them. Why will she give up her own food to feed her children? Why, if there isn't, you know, you got a larger family and there wasn't enough slices of pie? and one of the kids got left out, why will mom give hers to that child and go without? Because she loves them. Why will mom stay up nights to the point of damaging her own health to take care of her children? Because she loves them. Why will a father protect his family with his own life? To the point of his own death, he'll protect his family. Why will he do that? Because he loves them. Why will a father work outrageous hours do all kinds of things so that he can provide for his family and try to give them a better life because he loves them. Why will a father go without? There's just things that, well, I can live without that. I'll do without that. I don't need that. We don't need that extra payment, We whatever, so that there's more money left over to be able to buy his children clothes and things like that because he loves them. Love has passion with it. Love has passion. It's not just a mental thing. It is a mental thing, according to 1 Corinthians 13. But there's a passion that goes with that. There's an emotional side to love that pushes us and and drives us to do things because it goes back to what Mary said on Thursday night. We're taking ownership for something. Parents who take ownership for their children will act like that. Parents who don't take ownership will abandon their children, walk away, put them to social services, and act like they never had any. Because they don't really love them. See, love is a passion, an emotion that drives you. That love, that passion, is what he wants us to have for the lost and for young uh, young Christians. That same love, that same passion. Folks, to truly love somebody, you've got to be willing to get into the dirt with them to help them out. You know, this business of standing on the top and looking in and saying, we love you, anything we can do for you, let us know, there you go. Uh Uh-uh, that that isn't real love. James, in the financial area, hits it from the angle of you see a person in need and you just say, hey, be blessed, we're praying for you. That's faith without works, that's not love. It says you've got to get in there and help them out. True love will get in the dirt and help them out, try to teach them, try to boost them, try to work with them. True love gets dirt on itself when you're trying to help somebody else. I mean, that, that's how it works. That, that's what true love is all about. You say, well, you know, you're giving the example of children here, and, and well, yeah, we do that for children, but are we supposed to do that for other people? I've got a little, you might want to take one of those pages, 156, 7, 8, right in there, Write these scriptures down. I want to show you something. The big word for love is agape, or agapio. They, they're, they're versions of each other. They're right next to each other in the concordance. They're versions of each other. And I'm just going to go down the concordance, just read a few things to you. Babes, I forgot something. You were going to share something. You want to come do that? I forgot that because my mind went off another direction. So take a break, and then we're going to come back to the, these scriptures. She was going to throw something in. She was waiting for that, I, was and I forgot that. Correct something that happened Thursday night. Um, because the sermon came five minutes before the service, I looked at the steps the Lord was showing me. I said, honey, this is what he's showing me. Get up there, do the thing. And I knew he had already showed me there was going to be prayer for people, deliverance and all the stuff that took place uh, Thursday night, which was glorious. 
Um, and so I was gearing toward 8 o'clock. So I was machine gunning what I was saying really quickly. And when I talked about, uh, in First John, when I talked about uh, love being the proof of the Holy Spirit being in us and then walking down those steps, and you have to kind of go back without me rehearsing everything if you want to check on this. Um, and I said, uh, as it goes into about talking about discernment of spirits, uh, or I, I just did it again, discernment. Um, is different than discernment of spirits. Discerning of spirits. And, and when I wanted to say discernment, I said discerning of spirits. And so that can be confusing because it is listed in the gifts. At the same time, um, what there, we were talking about in that chapter has to do with us as Christians. When the love of God is in us, we should be able to discern that is Antichrist anointing, that is not. That's basically we're talking about the agents of the Antichrist. It talks about that in the Amplify. So I just wanted to make that con correction so there was no confusion and to make sure that we got it online so there was no confusion. Good. Discernment found in Hebrews chapter 4, we grow in that. Discerning, being able to discern the difference between good and evil. Discerning of spirits is a gift of the Spirit found in uh, 1 Corinthians 12. Let me throw one other thought with that before we go back to our list of scriptures. She came out of 1 John. I want to throw something in here that a lot of times, again, is misunderstood. 1 John chapter 4, if you brought your Bibles, again, most everything's in the booklet, so we're not using the screen too much. Uh, I don't, wouldn't have this one there anyway. But I want you to notice something here. This is talking about the Antichrist spirit. I'll read three verses. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. Misunderstanding. That scripture has nothing to do with casting out demons. Nothing to do with it. And a lot of times it's used for, well, you've got to test the spirits. It is not talking demonic spirits. It is talking the, the spiritual atmosphere that we deal with. And you have to test it. And John gave you what to test it with. It's all about Jesus is the Messiah. He came and died for us and the world. And if you veer from that and get into, well, there's other ways to get to heaven, and there's other messiahs. That is part of the end-age spirit. That's part of the Antichrist spirit. It's not talking test demonic spirits there. It's talking test the prophets and see what they're telling you, and most prophets are in churches. Yep, exactly. Measure prophets against, and if you want to go back to what we said last Sunday, which we haven't gotten to that part of the review yet, but you want to go back to it. Test the prophets against selfishness, in other words, most of the time, if a prophet is prophesying to you, if all he's telling you is how you can make your life better and it'll be so much good for you and God wants to bless you and wants to, he's a false prophet. I'll just say what it is. Now, if you go to the gift of prophecy, which is 1 Corinthians 12, which Paul explains in 1 Corinthians 14, the gift of prophecy and the office of prophet is two different things. The gift of prophecy, Paul says, is for the edification of, Comfort and encouragement, 1 Corinthians 14, 3, I believe it is. Gift of prophecy is to edify you, build you up, encourage you, and comfort you. The office of a prophet does not flow in that. He'll do that, but he doesn't flow in that all the time. And, of course, selfishness, the, the power of the age that we're living in, which is the secret power of lawlessness of Antichrist. We, we explained that last Sunday. Selfishness, and that, that is the secret power of lawlessness. Second Thessalonians 2, it's selfishness. It's being concerned about me and looking at me in my life first. If all a prophet does is go down the line and tell people how good and wonderful God wants their life to be and how great things he's got for them and never offers anything to make them go, ooh, yeah, I better pay attention to that. Chances are really good he's a false prophet because he's flowing with the spirit of antichrist, selfishness. He's telling you what you want to hear for your wonderful little life. And a true prophet won't do that. Amen. True prophet will tell you what you need to hear for your life, but he'll also look you in the face and say, you know what? 
the Spirit of God is telling you you were wrong here. You need to get that fixed. So that's for free. Never planned to say that this morning. That just kind of came out. So go back to, we were talking about the difference of we're supposed to love the unsaved and new Christians, new believers, young believers, and we're supposed to be willing to own what's going on in their life, help them with it, get in the dirt with them, and so forth, like a parent, a father and mother would do for their own children. And a lot of times people will jump in there and say, but your love for your children is different. It is. It is different. I'm going to show you from Scripture here in just a bit. Love for your children is different. Matthew 5, just write the verses. I'll I'll read the the thought down to you from my concordance here. Matthew 5, verse 43, 44, and 46. 43 says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Agape. God kind of love. Unconditional love. 44 says, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. That word is agape. Matthew 5, 44. Agape your enemies. Love them with an unconditional love. Verse 46. If you love them that love you, which that could be your family, some cases not, but most cases hopefully it is. If you love them that love you, what reward have you? That is agape again. If you go to Matthew 10, and I just kind of went down the list, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That word love there is not agape. It's phileo which means to be a friend or fond of, to have affection for them. It is a less intense love than agape. So when we say, well, they're your family, you would lay your life down for them. On the basis of phileo, you'd lay your life down for them, but you wouldn't for someone else that we're commanded to have agape for? See, we reverse those. Well, family is different. It is different. It's less than the love we're supposed to have for each other. It is different. But we think it's more. Well, they're my kids. God expects me to. Show me in the Word. I just gave you a scripture that shows the family love is actually supposed to be less intense than the unbeliever love or love for newly saved or things like that. I'll just give you a few more verses. Matthew 19, 19. Love your neighbor as yourself, agape. Chapter 22, verse 37, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, agape. Verse 39, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, agape. Chapter 24, verse 12, uh, Because uh, iniquity shall abound in the last days, the love or the uh, agape of many will wax cold. Um, while we were yet sinners, Romans 5, 8, God died for us. He agape for us. And, and there's a lot of different scriptures, but you know what? We sometimes tend to reverse the actual order of what he's saying. And we're not willing to own, love someone who's not in our family as much as we're, we'll pour our heart and life out for our family. We won't do it for anybody else. That's a sign of the spirit of the age, that's selfishness. Isn't that wild? And we thought we were being righteous in that. Well, we just didn't study the word close enough, I guess. We need to take ownership for people, buy into their lives, and help them. So in a nutshell, what have we covered to this point? Last Sunday, we revealed and identified and began the process of showing what is the spiritual atmosphere around us like in the last days. We have to be aware of this because there's so many warnings in the Scripture about the last days. We believe we're living in the last days before Jesus could return. So what, what is the spiritual atmosphere going to be like? And we discovered this. According to the Word, the spiritual atmosphere of society will be the secret power of lawlessness, which is selfishness. The... The entire wave of rebellion that the Antichrist, the person the Antichrist, is going to ride into power is the attitude that permeates society, which is selfishness. All you have to do is promise them something for them, and they'll vote you in the office, they'll give you their allegiance. Is this going to be good for me? 
Boy, just look around in our country right now. We vote our pocketbooks. We vote our entitlements. It doesn't make any difference what the moral issues are. Is this going to be better for me? I'm voting for you, man. I need an Obama phone. I'm voting you in. You know, it's kind of funny, but it's what it is. So we covered that on Sunday. Monday, we went to the church and said, is this stuff getting into the church? And everything listed of the warnings to the church. In Revelation, the seven churches, five of them had warnings and said, you got to deal with this. Everything listed in there, except for a couple of things that are peculiar to the church, like false prophets, etc. Everything else fits in with 2 Timothy 3, which gives us the characteristics of society. So yes, this selfishness is trying to get into the church. The reason we call this pursuit is this. We can either have selfish, ungodly pursuits, or we can have godly pursuits. But either way, man has been designed to pursue. We will pursue something. We'll pursue what's best for us, or we'll pursue what God's asking us to do. But we will pursue. The first two, Sunday morning and Monday night, were selfish, ungodly pursuits. Tuesday night, we talked about godly pursuits, or what does God pursue? Because we should be pursuing what God pursues. No matter what our physical job is, the thing that should be predominant in our life is we're trying to do what God is trying to do. We're trying to pursue what God's trying to pursue. What were the four major categories? Number one starts with S. Salvation for ourselves and everyone on this earth, and there's a whole bunch of things that come in under salvation. Number two, blessing. He wants everybody in this earth blessed. The first message Jesus gave, the first word that fell out of his mouth, and the first sermon he spoke was blessed. And he dwelt on that. Next thing he wants for us? Discipleship. And the last thing he wants for us? Intimacy with the Spirit. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Intimacy with the Spirit. Those are the four major categories. They're listed in your book, but those are the four major categories that God is pursuing. We need to be pursuing the same. Whether, no matter what our secular job is, we can always be passionate about getting people saved, getting them in a position they're blessed, getting them in intimacy with God, discipling them. I mean, that that is the bottom line to what everything's about. So then Wednesday night, we talked about what he's told us as a church he wants us to do and what we're supposed to refocus from and look towards. In other words, refocus from your selfishness and you know, you look at the prophecies and stuff, and it's like, wow. Refocus from the selfishness and get on to what I'm trying to accomplish on this earth, which is primarily, number one, the lost and young Christians. And he told, uh, we looked at how people are being handpicked to build what God's trying to do here. And he said, I'm needing mothers, I'm needing fathers, I'm needing families to accomplish this because institutions don't raise babies. Families raise babies. And that's the same thing for newborn babies or people who are still young in the Lord, immature in the Lord, still infants, still babies in the Lord. Maybe they're saved, but they haven't grown up in their, in their faith, in their doctrine yet. They need families. They don't need institutions. They need families to come alongside them and help them. And he was basically saying, pick. You know, are you in with me or are you not? Thursday night, Mary talked about 1 John 3 and 4 and how that love is shown as being the main way you distinguish Antichrist spirit from God's spirit. And if you go through it, I mean, again, it's pretty plain. Antichrist spirit turns you selfish. It's all about me. 2 Timothy 3, he said, in the last days, there'll be horrible times. People will be lovers of themselves. It's all about what's best for me. How is it going to benefit me? Don't inconvenience me. Don't ask me for something. Don't make me give up anything. I'm interested in me and the love of money, and it goes on down in that list in 2 Timothy 3. So we looked at on Wednesday night, we're not supposed to be driven by that. There's a whole different realm, and you'll have to go back and listen to it to get the whole thing. But are we buying into what God's asking us to do? Thursday, Mary talked about the the love thing and the distinguish between selfishness and love. This morning, we're going to talk somewhat about the power thing, and I thought I had it kind of, well, I didn't. I've been struggling with the, the, the emphasis of this message all week long, 
And I thought I finally had it, and this, I woke up this morning at 5 o'clock, and the Lord started talking to me, and I thought, okay, there it is. Now I've got it. So let's jump in and talk about some of these things a little bit and move on from there. Again, this is the portion of the book where God's been telling us what he's trying to do in Word of Life and how he's trying to accomplish these four major pursuits of his, how he wants us to pursue those four, but what is the flavor of, for us going to be? How is it going to come out of us? So that's what we're going to look at this morning a little bit, and then we're going to go to the the big part at the end, and I've got a lot of different points here. So again, grab one of those blank pages. I wrote it in on page 156 because on, on chapter 7, starting on 155, it says God's current pursuits and word of life. You've got, you've got a, quite a list there of things that by now you should go down those and go, yeah, I can see that. There's a couple you don't understand yet. Number five, um, number six, we'll touch those briefly this morning. So in the bottom of 156, you might want to write in these pages, and, and this is how God wants to pursue through us as a church. We'll start on page 136, and I'm going to go fast again because i got quite a bit to cover. So uh, if you can keep up with me turning pages, that's good. If not, just make sure you write it down. Number 136, number 55 there, and Bruce Venata, this was during his meetings in 2011, he emphasized this. He said it is not a power thing, it's a love thing that releases the power. So when we're looking for how is God going to do it through us, he's going to do it through us supernaturally. He wants us to operate in the supernatural. But it's get get the priorities right. It's not about pursuing power, it's about pursuing love which releases the power. We're not to be power or glory seekers. The baseline motivation for wanting to see God move in people's lives must revolve around love for those people. Now, isn't it incredible? He said that two years ago, three years, no, no, 2011, that's four years ago already. He said that, and this whole book just substantiated that statement. Isn't that amazing? The whole thing that God showed me just substantiated that statement. So please mark that. Go to page 146. So we're to be a people who are willing to buy into other people's lives, take ownership, get in the dirt with them, show them love, walk along with them, and help them get it done. That's 136. Now page 146, number 73. Jim Isaacson, he was here at the beginning of 2013, two years ago, when the first meetings we had in this sanctuary, in this building, And he said he went to the modular to kind of just pray a little bit before he came over here. And when he was sitting in the back in the modular there, the Lord told him, now begins the outreach. Which is is going to be a shuffle. It's going to be a switch. Now begins the outreach. So in other words, up to this point, the focus in God's perspective that he was giving to us was not primarily outreach. It had a lot to do with healing and ministering to his people and getting his people to experience the love of God, sense the presence of God, do these kind of things. Now we've come far enough, he says, now we have to really begin the outreach. And Jim is pretty accurate. I I really trust him when he says God told him something. And then when he came over here that first week of meetings, he said, well, what we're doing here is we're digging a well. Well, digging a well is for what reason? Go to page 147, letter C. Brian had a message come through him, uh, called in the lost, or called the lost in for me. Uh, Jump down to the bottom of the page 147. It starts with, he said, there is a reason for what he's doing and how he's doing it. Because I was still trying to say, God, we don't have an open heavens established here over this building yet, back in 2013 when we just moved in, I said, what are you doing? How do we establish this? He said, the reason for the open heavens is different over this building than over the other building, the modular. The timing of opening it will be tied to the purpose for it being opened. Go to the next page. Okay, that's what he told me during Jim's meetings. Then Bruce showed up for three days, and the Holy Spirit said, God always works in a progressive forward movement. The things of the past are not random happenings that do not apply to today. This is, some of the stuff came through Bruce. This is what our first set of open heaven meetings in the new building, this was about it. When we were told to pursue with a, when we were told to pursue with a bigger building, what else were we told to pursue? Love for the lost, love for the babies, place for them. Now we have the physical building, Now begins the outreach. Call in the lost for me. 
And then the Lord told me, the open heavens that will establish over this facility is not like the last building. It's for us, but it's not going to be about us. It's going to be about others, which points to everything he had been telling us over the years of, I want you to go after the lost and the newly born again ones who are struggling spiritually. Points to the next revival. Now begins the outreach. What does digging denote? Right on top of 74 there at the bottom of the page. Pursuing the manifestation of the fullness of God for the babies and the lost, not us. We're digging a well so that water can go out. Now, the laborers are first to eat of the harvest, so we will get to drink of the same water. But it's the priority or it's the emphasis. Is this all about us or is this about reaching out? Okay, now jump over to page 117. So how are some of the ways God wants to do this? Well, there's nothing here that I'm going to say to you that is really different than what the Scripture already says. Although a lot of times churches don't emphasize it, churches don't talk about it, so it may stretch some of you a little bit this morning because I'm going to bring up things that are in the Word, but you don't get to hear about them a lot. They were told to us through prophecies because the whole, or, or words or people saw visions or had dreams, which that right there may stretch some of you. Visions and dreams, what? Visions and dreams, Acts chapter 2 is is a predominant language God wants to use in our day. In the last days, you will see visions and have dreams. It's predominant languages he wants to use, and the church has all but abandoned them. I mean, how many Christian people do you know of that their church is saying, we've got to learn how to flow in visions and dreams and learn how to interpret them, and we've got to do this? Oh, that passed away with the apostles. Then what in the world was it talking about in Acts chapter 2? Yeah, it, it's Visions and dreams are very much a part of the last day's language. But there are some other things here. On page 117, so he's telling us some things. Uh, third, under Number 42, third paragraph down. What took place a number of days ago was the imparting of vision. Is not an end, it's the beginning... It's the means to something I have called you to. Do not look at it lightly. Don't take it lightly. Uh, it's holy ground. Don't, don't mess with it that way. Go to the next paragraph. This is the beginning of what is for you, but it's not about you. This is the beginning of the flow of the moving of my spirit that I intend to pass on to those after you. Again, speaking of the generations. Remember, remember, I've told you over and over, what I'm about to do in this earth is about the generations. Jump down to the next underlined portion. Too many of my people miss what I'm trying to do in this earth because they're looking for something that will please them rather than seeing the flow and intent and the purpose over the span of time, the generations, that pleases God, pleases me. They back away from the moves of my spirit. They back away from facets of how my spirit would work in them. They back away from the supernatural because it doesn't please or fit or feel right to them. Top of page 118. Let me restate. This isn't about you. See, once we're saved, once we're on our way to heaven, we are no longer the great focal point of what God's trying to do. We already have salvation. Now, the salvation is for us, and all the promises are for us, and they're to live in us. But now, not only is he focusing elsewhere he tells us to focus elsewhere where on those who don't have salvation yet see so it's still for us but before you're saved before you have a relationship before you have eternal life and your sins are forgiven it's about you as you grow and mature it becomes less and less about you and more about those who haven't experienced what you've got My father has a plan to save and rescue whoever will come to him. You've already come. It's no longer about you. You're my servants. You're my vessels. You're my friends. You're the light, the salt. You are the epistle to be read by those who still need to come. Do not be so self-serving. When was this spoken? 2009. He was talking to us about selfishness. Do not be so selfish or self-serving that you back away from what I'm trying to do because it doesn't fit your thinking, and it doesn't please you. 
I am pleading with you, there are eternal souls that hang in the balance that will be determined by the attitude of your heart. So there again, he's reemphasizing. Here's what we're after. Here's the focus. Go with me to page 95. Now here I'm just going to start referring to some things and not read too much, so just mark the spots. Page 95. The second big, or the first big paragraph, it starts with, I came and laid down spirit for spirit. If you go down to the last five lines, last one, two, three, four, five, yeah, that should be right, five or six lines, it starts with, read my book, what does my book say happens, the last time begins as the last time begins to be revealed, and he talks about the physical responding to the spiritual realm. He explains that some. Go down to the second paragraph from the bottom, the underlined part. Those who push into me will find themselves pushing into the realms of the spirit, of the spiritual. Well, what does that mean? Well, he's going to explain it to us here in just a little bit. Go over to page 96. First, he warns us at the top of the page, be careful you handle this correctly. Don't mishandle this. And as I was speaking this, he gave me a, a, a vision that is explained under there where it says Pastor Byrne, and it looked like a transparent, opaque kind of bubble that people were pushing against but couldn't get through. And it is the barrier between the physical and the spiritual realm in this prophecy. Go down to where prophecy reveals, uh, resumes, my mistake, second line. Uh, he says, draw unto me, as you do, your spirit will take on the characteristics of me in a more definite, more pure way. Your spirit will find itself being able to step across that opaque barrier. Step through beyond the physical realm into that spiritual realm. This is what it will look like. This is what he wants us to operate in. To begin with, it will be brief glimpses, and then it will become more. That is the vision thing he said was not part of. You will start seeing things that you wouldn't be seeing in the physical realm. This may stretch some of you. That just sounds flaky to me. Well, I don't know. When you read through the New Testament, there's a lot of people had visions in there. I mean, the gospel, Paul had the Macedonian man speak to him and call him to an entire different continent through a vision. There's, there's a lot that God does in leading his people through seeing things that you don't see in the physical. But you're seeing into a different dimension, and he's speaking to you that way. The only reason it seems a little weird is because it happens so few times. That's the only reason. Visions are not weird. Visions are from God. Ooh, it just sounds creepy to me. That's because we are that far off the track. That's why it it seems so weird to us. And he says, then he goes, you think that one was weird. Now watch what he says now. And there will be times I will take you into that realm where you will step out of your bodies, as my word declares, and you will see what you will know and you will understand. In other words, out-of-body experiences. He says that even scriptural. Paul had them. Paul had him. God showed him things that he couldn't get a grasp on in the physical, but God pulled him out of his body, pulled his spirit out, and he said, let me show you some things in the spirit realm, then you can go back in and it'll make sense to you. We know for sure. I mean, Paul had him over and over. Brother Hagen had him. I've had one out-of-body experience, which I'm not going to talk about, but I'm going to talk about Brother Hagen's a little bit. He had them. In fact, he had numerous of them. Uh, one of them, he was struggling in the church, and there was, there was an, an attitude or, I don't want to lose my place here, but I want to walk around more than I'm walking around. I feel constricted to this podium. <laughs> he was having some struggles in his church, and there was some spiritual things going on in the church that he didn't like. It didn't feel right. It was, it was not God, and he couldn't get a handle on it. He just couldn't, couldn't get a handle on it. And if I remember the the details of the story correctly, he was sitting in his living room, sitting in a chair one evening, just kind of doing whatever, and all of a sudden, boom, he left his body, ended up in the back seat of a car where in front of him, behind the wheel, 
was one of his board members from the church, and over here was a woman who was not that man's wife. They didn't know he was there. He's sitting in the back seat, and these two start getting involved in ways that a man shouldn't with a woman who's not his wife. And while he's sitting there, the Holy Spirit said, there's your problem. Boom, he was back in his body. So he confronted the men on it. He did what every good Christian man does. Denied it. Absolutely not. I mean, what proof would Hagen have that I did this? God told him. He just flat out denied it. Hagen said, well, let me describe to you. You were parked here. You were by this store. She was sitting over here. This is what she had on. You were sitting there. This is what you had on. And let me tell you some of your conversation. You repeat it back to him. He said the guy kind of went white. Okay. God must have showed you. That happened through an out-of-body experience. See, it, it is scriptural. It is possible. It's just it happens so seldom that sometimes we freak out. You say, well, why would God want us to do that? Well, he'll show us here in a bit. So now let's go fairly quickly. Page 97, that top second paragraph, make a mark there. You need to know what's going on there. Again, there's some warnings to handle this carefully. Jump down to the second from the bottom paragraph, and it's talking about the angels getting involved with what God's trying to do, and they're opening uh, realms that have been shut. They're, they're, they're making access to things that have not been opened. And at a different point, I think he calls it, well, he calls it right there, gates and doors, first thing there. And there's another spot, I think page 103, it talks about it also, gates and doors being opened by angels. They're working with us to get things to happen in the spirit realm. You say, is that even scriptural? I mean, do angels even do stuff like that? I mean, this could be all false prophet stuff. We always have to measure back to the word. Always, 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 always. So let me ask you a question. When you get to the book of Revelation and you've got the seals, vials, and trumpets, who initiated and opened those? Jesus started the process in chapter 4. And after that, the angel blew the trumpet, the angel poured the vial, the angel opened the seal, and it made everything take place. That was going. It just opened things up, and now here we go. Is it scriptural? I don't know. It looks scriptural to me. It can happen. You see, it just seems spooky and weird because we don't understand it. Once we get to the other side and look back, it'll make perfect sense. If we jump in here and get involved, it'll make perfect sense to us. Page 98 and 99. Again, top underlined part there. Uh, that's important, as well as the bottom of the page telling us, again, a warning. Press into me. Watch out for this. And watch out for pride. Guard pride. Guard pride. Guard pride. The last underlined sentence there on page 98. And at a different point, I think it's the next page, he says, if you get into pride, he says, I will take away everything you've made in forward movement, and you'll start all over again. Guard pride. Stay out of pride. Page 99, um, he again warns us of selfishness there, the second paragraph, the top of it. Page 107. And this will come together before we're done here. It'll make sense to you. Page 107. Uh, second paragraph from the bottom, the bottom three lines that are underlined there. You are entering into a day that will be very, very, very supernatural. Well, again, that's going to be more than just the church. You read the book of Revelation and the false prophet and the Antichrist and that whole thing, it is going to be very, very, very supernatural. In fact, one of the ways that the entire earth is going to be deceived is through the signs and wonders that the false prophet does. So it's going to be very supernatural. I don't want you to miss it. You are entering into an age, into a time, into a phase of this earth's history that will be very, very supernatural. Go over to page 114. So are you seeing a trend here of he's saying, I want you to operate in the spirit. I want you to operate in the things of the spirit. And he names a couple that are really out there, I think, just intentionally to stretch us. You know, if he'd have said, well, some of the gifts of the spirit... Okay, cool, we understand that. It might stretch a few of us, but most of us would go, well, you know, I understand faith, and I understand that God can heal and miracles. So he picks something that makes you go, huh? 
in an effort, I think, to stretch us. Page 114, um, middle of the page. The Holy Spirit is speaking. He says, I have been granted the right and the ability to fulfill and wield the Scripture and the promises. Where does that come out of? Ephesians 6.17, the Amplified Version. Write that down. And take the sword of the, the sword which the Spirit wields, it says in the Amplified. Yeah. Ephesians 6, 17. Take that sword and use that sword. Jump down to the next paragraph. The, the earth is needing a display of the raw power of my Father, and I wield that power through you. And, of course, it's by the word. Uh, middle of that paragraph. I need a people who are willing to wield the raw, invincible, unconquerable, unfading power of Almighty God. It will bring this generation in. Oh, so there's one of God's pursuits. He wants people to get saved and blessed and discipled, and he's telling us one of the ways to get their attention and bring them in. Learn how to wield the raw power of God. And I don't have time to dwell on this, but I thought, well, what in the world is the raw power of God? And there's only one thing in a concise form that makes sense to me that'll make sense to you. It's like, yeah, that's kind of a a nutshell description of the whole thing. When something's not raw, it's refined or processed. He says, don't take my power and refine it and process it. Let it just flow in its raw form. So in other words, you don't have to have a bottle of oil and take the one drop and dab it on somebody's forehead for someone to get something from God. You don't have to line them up in front of church, have prayer line for something to happen, for the power of God to move. Don't refine it or process it. Just learn how to tap it and let it flow. See, so when he's talking the raw power of God, he's, he, he wants... See, we have a way of making traditions around everything. You know, it's just human beings. Jesus is at the Mount of Transfiguration, and you've got two, three disciples there with him. And this huge supernatural event takes place right in front of these guys, and they're watching Jesus be transfigured, and Moses and Elijah come and talk to Jesus, so they're seeing in the spirit realm, and things are happening. And then all of a sudden, everything leaves, and they're back to normal And the first thing they brought up, remember? Should we build some kind of altar, little tabernacles here to remember this? They want to process it. They want to refine it down. They want to make it something they can keep their head wrapped around. That's what human beings do. Just let the raw power of God flow without getting all technical and into methods and into procedures. Just find the spirit on it. We've had two, three people here this week healed um, from things, and, and uh, one was going in for a second surgery. I don't want to put you in a spot, Sammy, but Sammy had hurt her knee, and they did surgery on it, and uh, she messed up her ACL. Okay, Did surgery on it, and she's been in therapy, and it's not been progressing for four, five, six weeks. And the doctor says, this thing don't change. You're going in for a second surgery. She said, can we pray? I said, let's let the raw power of God wheel. That's what went through my mind. What do we do? Well, let's just tap into the raw power of God. This is no issue. I said, so what's the problem? She told me what the problem was. We prayed over it. Uh, right away, it changed. She was walking. Right away, her leg was moving. It was, it was much freer. It wasn't totally there yet. Much freer. And she was moving and walking, went to the therapist, and the therapist said, wow, whatever you just did, keep doing it, because now you're making progress again. What happened? The power of God touched her. You know, that, that's all it is. Well, did you dab her head with oil? I don't think we did. I don't remember doing that. You know, it, it's, let's just let it do what it wants to do without putting it into some kind of, well, let's get in the right container to bring it to you. No, just let it be raw. Let it do its thing. Um, this one you have to see, and then I'm going to start skipping some stuff because we're coming to the end, and I've got to finish this. Page 121. bottom of that remember he told us you need to learn how to step into the spiritual realm well we did that with laying hands on sammy we went to the spiritual realm we called for some things and god manifested well it gets it gets big he says bottom of that page those those it starts with i'm calling those underlined portions there i'm calling for those who will step into the realms of my kingdom my kingdom covers this earth And when you establish and maintain an open heavens, now catch this, when you establish and maintain open heavens, you are not bound by space, by time. 
There are no limitations as you understand it. You can call and have jurisdiction over events and situations and things that are not physically anywhere near you or even in your present time. It's the realms of my kingdom. The thinking of that realm is much, much different than the average child of mine thinks. So if this open heavens is about the lost and about reaching out to people and helping them change their lives, as we learn how to tap into visions, as we learn how to tap into God showing us things, we can go to bat for them, and they might be hundreds of miles away, but get some things moving in their life spiritually so they come to the fullness of what God has for them. That's part of the way he wants to do it through us. Page 122, he talks about enlarge your thinking. Of course, you're going to have to to grasp that. Spiritual rulership. And again, he talks about the gift of vision. Bottom paragraph. The anointing and the gift of vision, which has been released and will be released over and over. We're going to do it again this morning for whoever wants it. Third line toward the end. This anointing, this tool will be used greatly for those of you who follow me with abandonment. Next line, I will show you things that you would physically not see. Bottom line, midway through, there will be times some of you will stand there and I will use what my word speaks of and supernaturally take you to the place and let you see or let you see what you need to see. Yeah, I'm calling you to the halls of the corridors of victory. Remember that whole vision and that whole prophecy? It all revolves around vision supernatural vision, and even out-of-body experiences. I'm calling you to the halls and the corridors of victory. Uh, Remember my bottom of that, the bottom three lines. Remember I told you my servants, as you would refer to as angels, my servants have been given keys to unlock doors and gates and areas and have been held shut for millennia. It's beginning, it's begun. And he wants us to join in with that. Page 124 and 25, there's some requirements there, which basically means just pursue them with all your heart. 146, I want to touch this yet. Just a couple, three lines here you need to see on page 146 because this is part of the vision thing that he just gives the bottom of the scroll. He just keeps enrolling the scroll and shows us more pieces as time progresses. Second paragraph, top three lines. I will begin showing many of you the faces of people that are in your hands, in our hands spiritually, to do something to help them. It's going to show us the faces. Their destiny, their future will be based on whether you obey me or not. How will they hear except someone goes and preaches to them? I will begin showing you the faces of people. In this supernatural vision or visions he gives to us, he is going to show specific people to us we're supposed to pray for, enter into that spirit realm and go after it and get them in the kingdom, even though we may never meet them in our lifetime. Well, I've never met them. Well, we don't have to meet them. Go into the spirit realm, do you some praying, do some intercessory prayer, and get things set up so they get into the kingdom. Yeah. See, it's, it's absolutely huge. So now let me wind this up with what the Lord told me this morning and, and so forth. When it comes to the supernatural and the power of God, and hopefully I didn't stretch some of you beyond what you're stretchable and now I broke something. <laughs> Pulled the rubber band too far and it snapped. <laughs> but there it is. That's what he wants us to go for by faith. So when it comes to the supernatural, the power of God, again, you're going to want to write this down, some of these points. So find a blank page there, 158, 159, whatever. But when it comes to the supernatural and these kind of things, there is a white elephant that usually gets avoided. It's big in the room, and most people don't like to talk about it. Most ministers don't like to talk about it. Uh, we tend to do what I call the cheerleading thing. Let's just say positive and get in there and God will do it for you. And they come out of the game. I'm reminded of when when my children were little, Felicia and Jess played on a soccer team, that it was a a local yokel thing for little little children. And their their suits were, were green. Their outfits were green. That was the color of their team. And their coach would always yell, Get in there, green! Get in there, green! And they'd come back out to the sidelines. But coach, it's not working. We don't know how to stop it. And the only answer that coach would have is, 
Well, just get back in there. Get in there, green. You can do this. And sometimes that reminds me of ministers. But pastor, it's not working for me. Well, get in there. Just go in there and it'll work for you. But pastor, I've been trying for the last three months since you told me to get back in. It's not working for me anymore. Well, get in there, green. (laughs) And we're cheerleaders. Go on, go on, go on. And the big white elephant of, hey, it's not working for me. Don't talk about that. Get in there, green. Don't talk about it. It's not worth it. The plays aren't working. The, the system's not working. I want to talk about that a little bit this morning, and I think the Lord showed me something that really makes some sense. You're going to need your Bibles. So that white elephant, how do we approach that? And I'm going to talk about a couple of things concerning approaching that. Go with me to the book of James first. How do we approach that? How do we look at it? How do we handle it? What do we think about it? What do we do with it? Because not everything works all the time. If you haven't discovered that one yet. You know, sometimes we pray for things and pow, it's just, bam, you got the answer. And the next time it's like, are you hearing a thing I am asking for and saying here? Because nothing, it's getting worse. Hello? You know, and it's just not, it's not happening. So what do you do with that? And stay in faith. You know, there's, there's whole denominations who've been born out of that situation. Well, see, we no longer believe in the supernatural. We don't believe healings for it today, and that's our excuse for it not working for us. Well, see, it passed away, so it's not supposed to work for us. So we're good. We're good. We're good. It's not supposed to work for us. Well, I don't find any place in the Bible where it says anything ever passed away. You know, that's usually the first question I ask. They say, well, it passed away. Well, could you show me that verse, please? Because I can't find that one. Well, it did. It passed away. Well, I'm good with you. Just show it to me. Well, not all the wisdom of God is in his word. Well, this one is pretty big. I would like to see this one in his word. You know, it's, this one passed away thing is pretty big. James chapter 1, verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And then he goes into wisdom, says, if you don't know how to get this, ask God. And he'll give you wisdom concerning it. I want you to see that verse. I want you to see this verse because it goes with what I'm going to say here in a bit. 1 Peter chapter 1, just next book over, verse number 6. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. See, it's not all, it doesn't, I'm not talking about people getting killed in car accidents, dying of cancer, things like that. I'm talking about your child is sick and you prayed for them and they're still sick. Your, your job is struggling and you're praying about it and your job's still struggling. I'm talking about everyday things that we are to grow in and overcome. Yeah. Trials. Yeah. So it, it, not everything goes right all the time. So what do you do with that? These have come, verse 7, so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So there's a reason for these things taking place. And this is what's going to happen. One thing I've noticed, you know, the Lord woke me up this morning. He said, I want you to talk about this. And the first thing I told him, Mary laughs at me. She says, you, the way you talk to God. She said, I I just couldn't do that. I said, he knows me. He knows where I'm coming from. He said, I want you to deal with this. The first thing I said is, I'd prefer you find someone more experienced. I've never heard anybody deal with this. And I'd prefer you find someone who's got more experience on this and let them deal with it. And then I'll look at that and maybe parrot them or something, you know, say what they said. And this is what he said. He, he's got a sense of humor. He says, you're almost 60 years old. How much more experience do you need? <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, now there you got a point. You know, I should have learned something by now. He said, just tell them what I'm telling you. Well, the one thing I've noticed is when people go through difficult things in life, trials, situations, they're not turning out right. We're believing God. We're praying. We laid hands on. We anointed with oil. We, we, and it's not going well. It's going to do one of two things in those people. It will either grow them, just like he says here. Your faith is going to be refined. It's going to be, it's going to be made more precious than gold. It's going, to be, it's going to be made more pure. Or back over here in James, he says, as you go through this testing of your faith, it's going to mature you. It's going to create a better you. 
And it's, it's going to produce good things. So it's either going to make them better, and they will eventually walk in more power or more supernatural. Their faith will be strengthened. An example of that is Bruce Fanata. He's one that most of us know. He went through horrible trials, but now he flows in the supernatural and healing and signs and wonders greatly. So as he came through, that was the result. That was good. That was better. Um, I had a, a, our president at Bible college. I keep looking at that clock, and it just keeps running. Um, I'm working on it here. Our president at the Bible college, uh, he was a pastor of a church, or was he? Yeah, I believe he was a pastor of the church. The Lord told him, he said, if anything happens to you physically, I do not want you in the hospital, because if you go to the hospital, you'll die. Within a few months, he had a massive heart attack. And his wife was begging him, please, let's go to the hospital. He said, God told me if I go to the hospital, I'm a dead man. He laid on the couch. He couldn't move for, it was 29 or 30 days. And he said, at the end of that, the Spirit of God came into me and said, get up. And he said, I got up. And he said, and he lived to be almost 80 years old. The doctors said that most of his heart wasn't working, but he rode bicycle all over and couldn't have convinced him most of his heart wasn't working. Um, he went through a tremendous trial, but it refined his faith. It made it stronger. Amen. And he came out the other end and became the superintendent of the the Illinois district and did that for years and years and then he became the president of the Bible school that I went to and he did that for years and years and then he retired and went on in life for another five, eight years before I think he was almost 80 years old or was in his 80s by the time he passed away. His wife passed away before him and she got cancer and they were believing for her healing and he said one morning she said this to me. He said, she said, could it be that this is what God wants and I'm supposed to die this way? And this was his statement to that. He said, that was the morning I buried her. He said, when she made that statement and got double-minded, he said, I knew it was over. He said, so I did my grieving. I went before God, said, God, help me deal with this, because if she holds on to this attitude, she's gone. And within a few weeks, she was, she was gone. And when he shares the story, he said, that was the morning I buried her. I didn't bury her out here when she died. He said, I buried her that morning because that's the morning she chose death. Because her faith wasn't being refined. It, was, it went a different direction. And here's the other direction people go. They'll go better or they'll go, you've heard it, they'll go bitter. They'll back away from the power of God. They'll back away from the supernatural. They'll mock it. They'll get kind of sarcastic toward it. Like, yeah, I've tried that. Man. And they're getting bitter. They tend to abandon faith and abandon things of the supernatural. And their attitude toward God tends to follow in with that bitterness. They don't love him as much. They don't trust him as much. They're going to try to do what they need to do many times to hang on to their salvation and get through this thing, but they've gotten bitter. Some people even lose their salvation over it. First Peter 1 Peter 1.9 there, the one scripture we read, if you go down to verse 9, he says that. Theology definitely changes many times because, well, we believe God and didn't go that way. So. so what do you do when you're caught in these situations? You say, but pastor, I've been so desperate, I've been so hurt that I can't take this anymore. I just have to back away and not believe God for this stuff anymore because it's, it's crushing me. Now think about, this. he pointed that out to me this morning because I said that. I said, well, what about these people who've been so hurt and so crushed? He said, think about what you just said. The problem is, this is hurting me so bad. I can't live this way. I've got to either get my answer or I have to give up to be happy. Who is that all about? That's a selfish statement. First problem, it became about me. Second thing is, 
as Christians, sometimes we pick up the concept, it's my job to produce the healing or the supernatural or the finances or the, you know, there's people that God has asked to work in the business world and operate in the business world and, and gather finances and shove it into the kingdom and they hit dry seasons where it's like, it isn't working. Why can't I produce this? Because you were never asked to produce this. You were asked to believe God and let him work through you, and there may be seasons where he flows through you greatly, and other seasons he's backing you up saying, hang on a bit, I don't want you to do anything now. But let him go. Let him do his thing. Our job is not to produce the supernatural. Our job, our work, Jesus said, is to believe. That's our job. The hurt feelings, the anger, the frustration, the bitterness, all that stuff that tries to come and reside in us is simply proof that I am not yet dead in Christ. It's still about self. I am angry. Dead people don't get angry. Well, I'm embarrassed for God. Dead people don't get embarrassed for God. Well, I feel like I've let God down. Dead people don't care. See, it's proof we're still too much alive. Galatians 2.20, I am dead in Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet it's not I, it's Christ who lives in me. Matthew 16, 23 through 27, if you want to have the life of God, you've got to die to your suki, your, your mind, your will, your emotions, so forth. And we pick up all these things of our emotions, our feeling, our thinking, our suki. I don't understand why God would do this. I've been serving God, and I am so frustrated, and I'm so at the end of this, I'm ready to just kind of take this whole thing and just throw it out and say, I don't believe it anymore. I, 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 I. Your job is to believe. The outcome is not your job. Your job is to believe. And when we start taking on the care of the outcome, we get angry, we get frustrated, we get our feelings hurt because it's not Christ through us, it's us through us. And here's a lesson from Job that I thought, you know, it's really good. He reminded me of this this morning. Usually not taught or seen. Once Job quit questioning, whining and complaining, trying to figure it out, that's what his three friends came We got to figure this out. We're going to, you know, 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 know. once he got over that, if you go to the end, Job chapter 42, here's what happened. Chapter 38, 39, God just basically slapped him back. First, he talked to the friends. He said, who are these people who are giving you this dark counsel who know nothing of what they're talking about? Which is kind of like, time to zip it. And then 38 and 39, he kind of slaps him back and he says, you people think you're so smart and you can figure out what God's doing. Were you there when I did all these things? Then chapter 40, verse 1 through 5, Job gives a response to that. Let me just read it to you real quickly. Because if you see this, it's going to make sense. The Lord said to Job, uh, chapter 40, verse 1 through 5, he says, will the one who contends with the Almighty correct the Almighty, correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. And then Job Job answered. He said, I'm unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth, you know. I spoke once and it was too much, you know. I have no answer. I will say no more. And then God goes on and continues to kind of lay it out through chapter 40 and chapter 41. You get to chapter 42, verses 1 through 6. Job replies and says, I know that you can do all things. Well, he just proved that starting in verse chapter 38 forward. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You ask, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you will answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust, in ashes, or sackcloth, in ashes. Job repented. Then you go to the next verses. God said, now this whole bunch that has been giving you advice, they're in serious deep trouble. They need to go sacrifice for themselves, and you, Job, need to forgive them, pray for their forgiveness, and then I'll forgive them. Most of the time, we as Christians fall into the Job's friends class. 
our questions are at the beginning of the book rather than looking at the end. Why? Because I don't want to have happen to me what happened to Job. So what can we do to make sure that never happens to me? So who are we basically looking out for? Ourselves again. It's selfish motivated again. If you go to the end, after Job went through all this junk, which is under Old Covenant, it worked different there, it, it doesn't directly apply to today, but the thought replies. Once he went through the whole thing and realized, okay, God, it's not my job to do all this stuff. My job is just to believe in you. I repent of all this junk I was saying, and I'm sorry, forgive me, and yeah, I'll help my friends get on track too. God restored back to him way beyond anything he ever left. What he lost. Restored way beyond. So many times we concentrate on how can I fix this so it never happens and never learn the lesson of God, you're right. I'm wrong. I don't know why I'm wrong, don't know how I'm wrong. Probably doesn't matter. But I'm sorry I'm wrong. And I'm sorry I talked to you that way. I'm sorry I developed this attitude towards you. I'm sorry that self got in the way here. I'm sorry and forgive me. And all of a sudden, things can change. That's the lesson in Job. Our job is to believe, not produce the results. We serve a God who cannot lie. Hebrews 6.18, Titus 1.2. The God who swore on two immutable things that his promises would be secure to his people, Hebrews 6, 13 through 20. So his people would know all arguments would be ended that his promises are for us. 2 Corinthians 1, 18 through 22, his promises are not yes for some people and no for others. They're yes for all of us. 2 Corinthians 2, 14, he leads us into positions where we can get into triumphal procession. We can win this thing. My job is to be dead to my psyche, or suki is the actual Greek pronunciation. It's the word life in Matthew 16, 23 through 27. He who tries to save his suki will lose his suki. You say, what is suki? It's my mind, my will, my desires, my thinking, my reasoning. It's the, the, the being of man, his feelings, his emotions, his thinking, his reasoning, his intellect, how he looks through things. God says, you've got to let that go. He who loses his life will find it, and he who finds his life, that's no longer suki, that's Zoe, that's the God kind of life. Now you're thinking like God. So he says you've got to lose your life to find it, and if you try to find it by hanging on to your own life, you're going to lose the God kind of life, and... There's two words there. That's what you have to remember. Suki refers to my way. Zoe refers to God's way. I have to die to my way to get God's way. Yeah. If you can just remember that much, you'll be good. It's Matthew 16, verse 23 through 27. I don't want to take the time to go through and pick it apart. Our work is to believe. John 6, verse 29. Never compromise the word. Well, it's not working for me. I'm just going to tear those pages out. No, your work is, your, your whole job is to learn to believe those pages so they actually begin functioning, operating. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35 through 39, persevere to receive. Don't shrink back. God doesn't take pleasure in those who shrink back. It says in Hebrews 11, don't be those who shrink back. Persevere. Even if you don't receive the whole thing, you will be rewarded for your effort. Not everything I've prayed for worked out right, even if I've prayed for it for years. But you know what? I will be rewarded according to Hebrews eleven six. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him or pursue him. We may not always get the answer we wanted, but when it all shakes out and we're standing before him in the judgment, he's going to walk over with this reward and say, you know that time you didn't get what you were after? I am so proud you didn't back off. You didn't hesitate. You just stuck with it and stuck with it and stuck with it. Here you go. Here's your reward. But I didn't get my answer. I don't care. Here's your reward. You did what I told you to do. You believed. Amen. Yeah. Not our job to produce the supernatural. Our job is to believe. 
Galatians 6, 9, don't become weary in well-doing. At the proper time, you'll receive if you don't give up. Uh, James 1, 5, ask for wisdom if you don't know what to do, but don't shrink back because to shrink back is to deny the power like it says in 2 Timothy 3. It is a big thing of the last days. It's a big characteristic of Christians in the last days. They will deny the power. They're going to shrink back from the supernatural. They're going to pull back from it. And if you put it in the whole context of what Paul was talking there in 2 Timothy 3, it has to do with selfishness. And it can be as simple as, I can't have my feelings hurt again. I got my hopes up, and I was dashed, and that's the last time. Well, if you die in Christ, you won't get your feelings hurt anymore. You're still too alive. I know that's ouch, I know. But that's what it is. We're still too alive. And that's why we got our feelings hurt. Here is a big point you have to remember, and with this I come to an end. My understanding of the way it lays out in Scripture is this. Either we die to ourself and do it God's way and just pursue what he wants for us before we get the power. That's what James described in James chapter 1 and 1 Peter chapter 1, those two verses we read. Either we will die before we get the power. That's what Bruce Venata experienced. That's what the president of the Bible school experienced. There's been many areas in my life it's like, man, I'm after this, and I'm after this, and I'm after this, and I'm after this. And once you die to yourself, your suki, the power becomes available. It either happens that way, or he gives you a gift of the power. It could be gifts of the Spirit. It could be whatever. He gives you a gift and then afterwards you get to die. That's how it worked with Paul. Paul was given what we call the Pauline revelation, or in other words, people are saved by grace. Paul was given that revelation. He was given that gift in the desert of Arabia when he was out there being personally taught by Jesus for two years. He just, boom, hit him with the gift of this knowledge and his apostleship and everything. And the rest of his life, Paul was dying. Whipped, flogged persecuted. Paul himself said, I'd die daily. So either we choose to die and the power comes because see, as long as we're the ones wielding all this, wielding all this, it's not God in us. It's us in us. We got to get out of the way so the spirit can wield his power through us. So either we get that done and then the power shows up or he'll just dump a gift on us and say, you ain't got time to wait. Let me give you this gift. And boom, the power goes. And then the rest, there's a big chunk of time out here. It might not be the rest of our life with Paul it was, but there's a big chunk out here where because of that empowerment and that gift, we are having to die to ourselves. Paul says that over and over. He said, I finally come to the place. I, I give everything up. All I want to know is his power and the power of his resurrection and to please him. And it, he finally came to the end of it. I can't fight this anymore. Just, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. To my ways, my thinking, etc. This much I'm sure. Read this with me. Acts chapter 14. This much I'm absolutely sure of. Whether we die to that flesh, that old nature thing, before the power, or the power is given as a gift, and then we die to it. This much I'm sure of. Everybody goes through this. Acts chapter 14, verse 21. They preached the good news in the city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples, encouraging them to remain true to the faith. And this is what they said. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. That word hardships is tribulations. It means the application of pressure and trouble. It's the same word. It's the same word translated trouble in John chapter 16, verse number 33. Same word. To get into the things of the kingdom, you're going to be put under pressure. Your faith is going to be tried either before or after the gift flows. This will happen. And he was trying to encourage them to remain true to the faith. Why? Because a lot of people will get bitter and will just back out on the whole thing. And if we do that, we won't have the power flow anyway. I mean, the supernatural won't happen. We have to die to ourselves. So I might as well hit this right away, too. I don't want to take any more time than I have to, but somebody's going to listen to this who's going to be into this hyper-grace thing, and they're going to say, but, Pastor, 
since Jesus already died for us, we don't have to die anymore. I've had him tell me that. You know, everything that Jesus did for us, we no longer have to do anything in that department. Well, I don't know what New Testament you're reading, but you're not reading mine. It's like, how in the world can you skip so many scriptures? Let me just give you one. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24 down through verse number, chapter 2, verse number 1. If you want to just write it down, I'll just read part of it. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you. Paul's talking about his own sufferings for these people, his dying. He got the gift, and now to get the message to these people, he's continually having to die to himself because people are betraying him. People are trying to kill him. He's being stoned, left for dead. He's being whipped. He's shipwrecked, trying to get to other nations, ends up getting bit by a snake, living in with these, with these uh, uh, native people, and, and then they get saved. So it's just, it's just like he's continually having to die to himself because I'm sure he was thinking, if I'd have known I had to go through all of this, I'm not sure I would have volunteered. But he had to die to himself to keep doing what God asked him to do. He says, now rejoice in what was suffered for you. In other words, I went through some pain and agony with me to get me out of the way for you. And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. So what in the world did Jesus not do that we have to? I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking. See, Jesus didn't do it all. In regard to Christ's afflictions. For the sake of his body, which is the church, I have become its... Oh, there it is. I have become its servant by the commission of God. In other words, I had to die to me to fill up. See, Jesus can't... Jesus can't make me die to myself and live for him. That's my choice. He did everything for me to do it, but I have to choose... Am I going to do this thing Vern's way or am I going to do it God's way? And the whole spiritual atmosphere of the age we live in is pushing on you saying, do it your way. You don't want to do it that way. That's going to be harder that way. It's not going to turn out best for you if you do it this way. In other words, if you don't take care of yourself, God's probably not going to come through for you in this because remember all the times you prayed before and God did nothing? We encourage you strongly and you just get this this impression this push if you ask people they say oh yeah take care of yourself i mean make make the right choice or you got to take care of yourself and your family blah, 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 blah. and you literally have to get to the point of but i know god's asking me to do this but everything around me is telling me to do this when i think about it and i write down the pros and the cons it just seems like the cons list is really long and the pros are god told me to do it and there ain't much under that so I'm tempted to go with the cons here. This makes more sense, which we talked about earlier in the week. This, this, this is, this, yeah. And until we get to the point where we say, okay, God, I don't understand all this, but I know that I know you're asking me to do this. I'm not going to do this. We haven't died to ourselves, And when we do that, then the power begins to flow. Well, if God would just give us the finances before we make the decision, then we'd know it was God. Have you ever prayed that way? God, I know you want us to go on a mission trip. If you just give us the finances, then we will then we'll commit. Without the money, no go. You never do get the money. You know why? There's no faith in that. Are you going to do what I told you to do, or aren't you? Die to yourself. Let me figure out the rest. It's not for you to produce the finances. It's for you to believe I told you to do this. Submit to me. And then we'll see how the finances come together. I'll do it for you. That is the huge lesson. And either it will come to us as a gift, the power, and then we get to die afterwards, or we get to go through horrendous trials, like it says in James and Peter, and then the power shows up if we go through them and get better, not bitter. That is the key to the whole thing. Did you ever notice, I'm going through my notes here, I'm going to skip whatever I don't need to talk about, but I just want to hit this. Did you ever notice that the greatest miracles and supernatural that we hear about happening in the earth happens to people who really don't have a life anyway? You ever notice that? 
Well, you know, all these people in Africa, I mean, they're starving. They're dying. They don't even have a home. They don't even have much for clothes. And God's raising the dead. Cancer's going. All kinds of stuff is happening with them. Because they don't have a selfish problem. They ain't got nothing to hang on to to begin with. They've lost it all. You go to where Mark Anderson's going, northern India. These people are living outside. They're starving. They have one set of clothes. Their teeth are falling out because there's no dentist to help them. They broke their arm and they're gimpy and they're walking like this because there was no doctor to do anything. They don't have a life. So they don't have to give up their life to get one. It's already gone. There's only one way to get one is, Jesus, I trust you to do something. Boom, limbs grow out, arms get straightened out. There's scientific doctor evident, doctor documented evidence of huge miracles that we never see here. Because we've got the right to go, I don't know. Should I do it my way or should I believe God? Believing God's hard. You know, I got disappointed a few times before. I think I'll do it my way. Well, there's no miracles in that. There's no power in that. So the big white elephant in the room is this. What do we do when things are not working? Well, number one, you never back away from God and his word because he does not lie. Amen. He swore on blood covenant that he would hold his promises. So it can't be God's fault, so don't blame him. Amen. God's perfect. There's, if, there's a, if there's an issue here, it's not on his end. Just say it that way. It's got to be something on my end. Number two, don't get bitter on him. Let your faith be tried. Go to the word. Ask the Holy Spirit for wisdom. Grow in your faith in this thing, expecting the power to show up. You say, well, if the power would show up, I wouldn't have to be going through this. Well, here's what it is. You can argue with God about it, and he can look at you and say, why do you think you know, like he did with Job? Or you can say, God, I trust you. Whatever happens here, Job's statement, though you slay me, I'm here. I'm with you. I will follow you. I'm going to go through this. I'm going to believe the word. I'm going to stay solid. And I'm going to believe for the best. And if I shoot for number 10, if I only hit six, six is a whole lot higher than if I give up here, quit, and say, forget this whole thing, because then I get zero. Right? Then it's zero. Then Then we get nothing. So we don't have to apologize and be ashamed of what we prayed for him and nothing happened. I prayed for myself a lot of times nothing happened. It's not God's fault. It's not his word's fault. And if I'm really, really honest, some of my prayers had a back door already created for me. You ever pray those kind of prayers? God, I'm believing you for this, but if it doesn't work out, I know what I'm going to do. I know. That's another one of those ouch statements. So it's still all about us. It's still about what we want. It's still self, still me. I got it covered, God, but if you want to come through with something super duper that makes it so much better, I'm here for you. I'm believing you. But if nothing ever comes through, I got it planned out. See, we're not like the people in Africa. We're not like the people in India. We still have our life we're trying to protect here, and I've got my things and my ways, and I'm not going to lose this stuff. If you come through and make it better, glory. If you don't, I'm hanging on to me. They've got nothing to hang on to. It's like either God comes through or I'm dying a cripple. There's no Obamacare. There ain't even an Obama phone. There's nothing. And you know what? Desperate people get big results. So we're done. I want to pray with two groups of people. If you're not interested in being prayed for, when I'm done with this, I'll, we'll just have a little prayer and you can be dismissed. I hope you got something out of this. Talked for quite a while. I hope you got some clarity on some things. God wants us as a church to walk in the supernatural, to live in the supernatural. It's the primary tool he wants to use to, to reach the generations. It's the scriptural tool. I mean, if you look through scripture, it's what he used. With that is vision, supernatural vision, visions, uh, out-of-body experiences. That, that I think, like I said, I think he named some real big things to kind of blow us back. But 
there's a lot of supernatural things, but the things I want to pray for is he said vision was imparted and it will be imparted many times. For those of you that want it, I want to impart that this morning and pray with you that God does that. I don't have it, but the Holy Spirit does. Number one, so a supernatural impartation group, and the other side is this. Pastor, you described me with the dying to myself, and I've been hurt and I struggle to believe God anymore, and could you just pray with me? I get over it. I'd love to pray with you. Because if we don't get over that, we never will believe God. We won't persevere long enough for his power to ever show up. We'll quit early in the game, and the faith will never be refined as by fire because we took the fire extinguisher out. As soon as it started getting warm, we blew that thing out. We're not going there. So I want to pray with that group. So if you're in either one of those two groups, I'd love to pray with you. Lord, for the rest of us, if there's those of us who do, want, do not want to be or are not feeling to be part of this, I pray in Jesus' name, bless us with, with who you are. Bless us with who you are. Insight, understanding, revelation. Lord, help us to understand that the predominant tool the enemy is using against every citizen on this earth, including Christians, on this end times, the predominant tool he's working in to make us lawless and to set the atmosphere so we'll be ready for the Antichrist to accept him, who is the lawless one, according to Thessalonians 2. The predominant tool is selfish. Get us so focused on us, our life, our self. It'll cripple outreach. It'll cripple getting people saved. It will cripple moving forward in evangelism. It will cripple us seeking your throne, taking ownership of people, trying to do what we can to help them out. It'll cripple us in multiple ways. So, Lord, I'm asking for all of us, help us get that. Help us see that. We have to pay attention that we don't, if we are selfish, we need to get out of it. need your help to get out of it. We need your help to get out of it. And if we're doing pretty good in that area, we need to really pay attention that we and our children or our grandchildren or whatever don't get sucked in by it. And everything in life revolves around what I want, my ways, what I think, what I'd like, that whole selfish thing. Because that's the tool of the end times against us. So, Lord, we don't want that. We want to be aware of it and be above it for all of us. So bless us. You want us blessed. It's one of the major pursuits you have after us, that we be blessed. Lord, I pray for health for everyone this week. I pray, there be, I pray there be no car accidents. I pray there be no mishaps. There be nothing unfortunate to happen to us to where when the week's over, we go, oh, wow, that was unfortunate. It's too bad that happened. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, your protection and your keeping be over us, that there be no unfortunate things that take place. Lord, we pray for prosperity, for, for success in moving down the road in marriages and in families and in jobs and careers careers and in finances. Lord, I pray for deals to come into people's lives and for situations to take place this week that will give them promotion in their company and or if they own their company that will give them a a deal, a business deal that would be powerful in moving them down the road for success. Lord, I pray who you are over us. Change us. Change us in our heart. Change us in the way we think. Make us to be more like you. From glory to glory to glory, your word says. From, from, from stage to stage, becoming more and more like you. I pray that over all of us in Jesus' name. Amen.